Welcome to My on Mondays, an explorative approach to the possessive my through narratives, art, and sound. Each Monday brings a new creation and unique perspective. My on Mondays is brought to you by Ming Studios, a contemporary art space and international artist residency program dedicated to the exhibition, experience, and exploration of arts and culture. Along with exhibiting artists from around the world, Ming also serves the community by hosting innovative programs including performances, workshops, screenings, readings, artist talks, and other cultural activities. For more information or if you'd like to participate in Maya on Mondays, you can visit our website at mingstudios.org. Hello and welcome to the 54th episode of Maya on Mondays. Today's piece is a continuation of the three-part series titled My Centuries, created by Heidi Cray. A playwright and writer across disciplines, Heidi's work examines the connection between brain and body, seeking empathy with fractured characters. Her work pulls myth, metaphor, and monsters together to attempt connections across difference. Her plays, including Unwind, Hindsight is 2020, See in the Dark, How to Hide Your Monster, New Eden, Me and My Shadow, Kilgore, as well as co-devised plays, plays for young audiences, one acts, and short plays, have been presented nationally and internationally. She's also a regular contributor to Ming Studios programming. You can find part one of her Century series as well as others in our archives. Her piece today is titled My Biggest Mistake. What the heck is a century? One hundred years? 100 thoughts, 100 images. In his century essay, Advent Manifesto, Does My Soul Still Sing?, John Paul Lederach notes that the Desert Fathers and other ascetics wrote down their thoughts in this numbered way, in a contemplative approach, like prayer on paper. That means this form may be as old as the 3rd century AD, perhaps older, Each idea is broken up by numbers, one to 100. Every new thought, new idea, new image gets a new number. The ideas, thoughts, images can connect, but that's not necessary. I've always loved lists. The century can be a way to explore what we remember and notice about our lives, but also what's going on in China, in the Ukraine, Antarctica, in the early 21st century, as well as the 19th century, 12th century, when the universe was starting to form, or the Earth, into the far-off or not-so-far-off future when the Earth is no longer inhabitable. The following is from my book in progress. 12 lifetimes, a century cycle. Thanks for listening. My biggest mistake. One, white Chevy one ton, our home. Two, he told me I was no longer safe in my town. Three, he convinced me to run away with him in the one ton with no thought of ever returning. Four, He swarmed me away in the van with four hippie traveler teens and their chocolate pit bull pup. Five, he fancied himself a Peter Pan among lost boys. Six, he wanted me to be their Wendy. Seven, he also fancied himself the second coming of Jesus. Eight, he wanted me to record our story, our mission, like Paul. Nine, Mom called every hour on my flip phone. I never picked up. Ten, she texted, have you been kidnapped? Eleven, I wrote back, no, and turned off my phone. Twelve, on the road, my boss from the theater called to offer work. I said, I'm moving out of state. Thirteen, oh, I'm mad at you. I couldn't tell if he was joking or not, but he took me off the call list. 14. We met outside the coffee shop I frequented on 8th and Bannock. 15. 
I biked there that February morning on my single-speed trek with funky cork handlebars. Sixteen, I was on my way up the hill to the blind woman's house where I worked. Seventeen, I wasn't planning to stop. I didn't have much time, but I knew I was going to be too early and might have to linger awkwardly outside her garage, so as I reached Bannock and 16th, I made a left and headed to 8th Street for a quick 12-ounce drip with lots of soy milk I could suck down fast to warm me for the rest of my ride. 18. There he was, standing with another regular on a lunch break, both of them on a smoke break. She introduced us. 19. Or rather, he introduced himself. 20. He looked attractive that day. Dickie's jacket, shaggy black hair. 21. But I'd had my share of men twice my age and didn't want to try on another. 22. I walked inside for my cup. 23. I was turning to leave when he invited me to sit across from him. 24. I wish I trusted my instincts, nodded politely, and left. 25. I wish I kept going up 16th Street that day and didn't turn left. 26. I wish I didn't sit and talk and flirt about big ideas or give him my number. 27. But as you say, save your wishes for cooling pies. 28. I remember sitting side by side with him over poisoned Lake Isabella, wondering how we'd get gas money. 29. I remember him figuring out how to drive the 40-foot bus after we traded the van for it, smacking into a stop sign, continuing on, no brakes, laughing. 30. I remember him scorning me for looking at my face in the passenger side mirror. 31. My bank account went deep into the negatives, buying gas I couldn't afford. 32. He pawned my MacBook guitars for money and spent most of it on weed. 33. He took things big and little from everyone we encountered. 34. My former roommate's cassette tapes. 35. So much money from everyone we met. 36. So much trust and hope squandered in each relationship. 37. He stewed in a pit of dark when he couldn't get his drugs. 38. I remember the first time he sucked into a hole of himself and spat at me with acid blood. 39. Until that moment, though broke, homeless, hungry, I still thought I was on a happy summer adventure of love. 40. I convinced myself his family, past wives, and friends turned against him like he said, because of them, not him. 41. He told stories about fighting demons in a park. 42. About fighting a mountain lion at the edge of a cliff and winning with only his hunting knife. 43. Said he'd been to war, but the army said he was too volatile and discharged him. 44. Said a drunk school teacher hit him from behind doing 90, and that's the cause for his pain. 45. Some of his stories may have been true, like him pistol-whipping his wife's boyfriend, which got him on the run from Colorado. 46. But he was a great storyteller, hard to tell what to believe. 47. We watched fireworks atop the converted Bluebird bus where we lived. 48. We'd taken the bus he named Panda to Venice Beach for July 4th so he could play drums on the ocean for a thousand people. 49. After I left him the next year, Dad called July 4th my own Independence Day. 50. I wondered if holding a cardboard sign or offering up my body was the better solution for how broke we were. 51. I cried on the rotting astroturf in our frozen kitchen. 52. I called that place the Gulag House. 53. Shut up, bitch! Yelled from the middle room of darkness where two space heaters ran, where we slept in his whirlwinds of smoke, a blanket hanging in the doorway between us. 54. 
In snarling heaves, he punched the wall beside me. 55. He never hit me. 56. One highlight? After him, no more one night stands. 57. He ripped me out of myself, leaving a shell. 58. His teeth pulled one by one, black at the roots. 59. He blamed the damage on an overzealous dentist and his mom's good insurance. 60. Everyone else said it was meth for sure. 61. In shouting rage, he knocked over the lamp. I curled in fetal position, facing the window. 62. Curled on the carpet, in the safe space I spent the new year writing and painting after we left the gulag house for the triplex in the same neighborhood where I live now, I cringed through soaking eyes as he threw down the standing lamp beside my head, growling like a rabid pit bull between fury cries. 63. Then he shoved out, doors slamming behind, and drove off in the Land Rover Discovery, full throttle, God knows where. 64. I told him I couldn't do this anymore. I was leaving that night on a plane to my parents' house in Ridgecrest. 65. He'd come to collect me, take me up to the property he was trying to buy, take me away from the city that was wedging a gap between us. 66. We bought that discovery together, using my good credit for the loan and money he got going on permanent disability. 67. After I left him, he kept the Land Rover, but it was up to me to keep up the payments or destroy my credit. My mom helped each month. 68. I learned to stop counting on him for anything, so didn't try asking. 69. Instead, Mom called in help from his well-to-do father, who agreed to split the payments. 70. A year and change later, when the green car was found abandoned in the Oregon woods, his dad paid it all off. 71. That last debt from him resolved, I felt us finally split, no tangible connections remaining. 72. But last year I saw the abandoned vehicle still registered in my name. 73, but he still comes at me in dreams. 74, but I still hear him saying, I know any time an ex thinks of me or my mom who won't see me or my brother, they come in my head and I know I'm on their mind. I know I'm still in them somewhere. 75, but every time I see a white van, a green Land Rover Discovery, a bluebird bus made into a recreational vehicle, I hold my breath, looking at the driver's seat, a prayer in my heart, it's not him. 76. But every time I see a figure about my height, wearing rough, dark hair and that fierce, hobbling gait in the distance, I turn and walk fast the other way. 77. A few months after we broke, I got a call from my friend at the coffee shop where we met. 78. Emmy came in today, looking for you, said you owed him a lot of money. I told him to get out. 79. I laughed at the idea that I could owe him anything, but inside the laugh was a scream. 80. He was with a bunch of other guys. They all had this dark, mean energy. He was wearing a long black cloak and looked ridiculous, but also scary. They were all smoking on the patio by the no smoking signs, and then he took this big drag by the front entrance, flicked the cigarette on the ground behind him, opened the door, and blew all the smoke inside. Part of me was nervous, but the other part thought, this guy talks funny without his teeth. 81. I laughed and loved my friend over the phone, but also rotated mentally through places I could sleep safely the rest of the week. I felt too naked alone in my apartment. He could find me. 82. I watched over my shoulder for weeks, months, years, a decade, more. 83. Often I wonder if he's dead, in prison, back in an institution. 84. Writing this century, I got curious and tried looking him up online. His name changes so often, it's hard to find much. 
He doesn't keep a web presence in part because he's wanted in multiple states, because of all the people he's cheated and abused that try finding him until they give up. 85, one thing I found on my search, a discussion board in the musician's forum, with posts beginning in winter 2008. His former business partner sent out a warning. 86, he said this guy who goes by Eric Michaels, but changes his name a lot, came through his town. He believed the guy's stories, hired him, got him all these drumstick sponsorships, The guy ended up pocketing all the business's money, got him fired for helping Eric out, who'd been living in his space, made a mess of everything there, ruined his life, and left him broke. 87. He said he heard Eric was driving up and down the coast again. Up to his old tricks? He wanted to make sure no one else got scammed. This guy is extremely manipulative, a con artist, he said. 88. Others chimed in with sympathies, choice words for Emmy as I knew him. The guy making the post followed up a few months later, then more recently, to say Emmy was heading to Montana to start it all up again. 89. I remember Emmy told me about his last business partner in Washington State, saying the guy cheated him out of everything. I imagine this was that guy, stories in reverse, warrant out for Emmy's arrest. 90. If I did any research, any checking up on Emmy's stories as he came into my life, I might have found this, the first posts made months before I met him. 91. Then again, would I already be under the spell? Would I still have believed this chameleon with changing names over the evidence in front of me, as I believed him over long-time trusted people in my life when they told me to run the other way, told me he was no good, pleaded with me not to leave with him. 92. The other thing I found on my internet search was an independent, low-budget film he made in Missoula between 2011 and 2014 with a production company called Emmy and Me Productions. 93. When I still considered myself in love with him, I told him I'd call our book of adventures Emmy and Me. 94. The film started with a footage of him facing the camera wearing a black robe with a hood around his head like a sinister monk. Dim lighting except on his face and torso, black and white reel illuminating his toothless, dark-haired face. Candles behind him, his grainy, affected voice, introduced the story like a Tales from the Crypt, Elvira-type character. 95. My heart pounded as I landed on the video and read the description. To make sure it was him, I watched and listened to a few seconds, but quickly skipped ahead, my vision starting to blur, hands shaking. 96. I couldn't watch the short film straight through, but dancing around with the cursor got the gist. Two young women stalked and hunted down by a middle-aged man, not played by Emmy. 97. With certainty, I guessed that the young lead actress was Emmy's current target. They were likely dating during the time of filming. I hope she got away from him, too. Part of me wanted to seek her out, reach out to her. 98. For years after I left, I wanted to write only about him as a way of warning other women. 99. Once he found me on Facebook and tried messaging me under the name Flat White Pebble in response to something I posted, said he was getting into the film business, writing scripts like me. 100. I blocked him right away. We're so glad you joined us today. We look forward to bringing you more episodes in the Mondays to come.